Love in a Time of Krona, episode 2, we were discussing Reinecke Organic Shilling. The wine we're looking at tonight is the Johan Reinecke Organic um, Shilling Blanc. There's a lot to talk about with this wine. Um, so let's just get started. I don't know if any of you know Johan Reinecke. For me, he's the silver surf of wine producers in the country. He's an amazing artist for the Prague. So let me tell you some stories about our friend Johan. And when I was doing my, my, my dissertation <laughs> thesis for this Cape Wine Masters, I went to go chat to him and he sat me down at a table and he gave me a bowl of noodles and he said, yes, Harry, what can I help you with? And I said, I want to learn about organic and biodynamic wine and I want to learn about strategy and, 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 and the different approaches wineries can take. He studied at uni- uh, the Stellenbosch University and he started off as a lawyer. And he didn't like that very much, so he changed to philosophy. And um, in his uh, holidays, he went to go help his dad um, work the, 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 the vines, the vineyards. And he said it became very real to him when as he was spraying pesticides and fungicides onto the grapes, that the chemicals were dripping down his back and onto his leg. He has it on his back like this. And he said... He couldn't deal with it, you know. Um, And so he said to, he he started to take over and he says he wants to make the wine farm organic or biodynamic. And he called in a lady called Jean Mal Herber, an elderly lady who's who's, who's, uh, since passed away. And he asked her for some advice on how to be biodynamic. And Johan is one of the pioneers on organic and biodynamic wine in our country. And what happened was she said, listen, What you're doing here is basically you are drugging your fields. You're throwing in pesticides, fungicides, fertilizers. So imagine uh, a field full of drugs. So you need to take them off the drugs, but understand that they're going to go cold turkey. And they went absolutely boss. They went absolutely crazy. For the first year, they were all over the place. The second year was even worse. The third year, they wanted to shut Johan down because they said he's just too crazy. Um, but what ended up happening after that was an equilibrium. The cost of, pro- uh, of producing uh, wine or, or looking after grapes in the vineyards in Stellenbosch, when I did the paper, was about 50,000 rand a hectare. With Johan's farm being in, in balance, he was only paying 35,000. He didn't have to water so much. He didn't have to put the pesticides and all of those kind of things. The biggest problem in our wine industry is a thing called leaf roll virus. Leaf roll virus is, is distributed, like the coronavirus, but it's the, the, the grapes coronavirus, by little mealybugs. And um, what happened was he's got the biggest concentration of these mealybugs. But because he's let the dandelions grow, and the dandelions are the mealybugs' favorite home and their favorite food, they don't go and eat the grapes. So he hasn't got any leaf roll virus. And, this is just, and I can tell you stories and stories and stories. And, and Johan's philosophy... It's always about upliftment. I went there, I've got a shares in a drone business, and I went to go speak to him about security. And I remember him looking at me and he goes, Harry, what happens when we catch the guy? Well, I think I said to him, what happens when you catch the guy? Because ADT aren't doing it. And he says, well, first we find out if you skill him or if they actually are really desperate and they need the help. And if they need the help, let's help them. So you can see his mindset is very different. His number one passion is surfing. And you'll find as we go through the wines, a lot of wine producers are surfers. Um, South Africa is the only place in the world where we have a Vintners Classic. That Vintners Classic was put in place by the wine makers. And it's a surf competition that happens in still by every year. And you have to be a winemaker or connected to the wine industry to compete and participate. And it's been going for 20 years. So that is something that South Africa has, which no one, nowhere in the world has. And that's pretty amazing. Um, we can get into the organic and we'll talk about the organic and the biodynamic in terms of the wine. The wine we're tasting today is a Chenin Blanc. And this is a very affordable Chenin Blanc. Um, let's talk about Chenin Blanc. So South Africa, Chenin Blanc comes from the Loire Valley in France. If you've heard of Vouvray, Savignieres, they're all of these different regions that make beautiful Chenin Blanc. South Africa has taken that 
now owns Shannon Blanc. It produces more Shannon Blanc than the rest of the world put together. It produces over 60%, I think, or up to 60% of the Shannon Blanc in the world. Shannon Blanc as a grape is a neutral grape. It can be used for everything. It's used in our brandy making. It's used in the spirits that fortify our, um, our sherry styles. It's used to make our sherry styles. It's made in bubbly. You can look at Ken Forrester. You can look at De Morgan's on. It's used for dry wines, sweet wines, noble late harvest wines. It's made across the range. When I talk about a neutral grape variety, it's neutral in that there's not many flavors that actually come from the grape. The flavors actually come from the wine making. So what yeast you use, whether you stir it on the lease, whether you use oak, whether you, whatever. The, it comes from the wine making. Chenin Blanc as a, as a grape. Remember we did Sauvignon Blanc two days ago. Chenin Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc are cousins. They both have Sauvignon as a, as a, as a parent. They don't know what the other parent is, but they're cousins. So they've got the same structure, high acidity. The difference is, uh, and, and can be quite fresh, the difference is Chenin can be sweeter. And the other difference is that um, where you ended off on the tropical spectrum with Sauvignon Blanc, that's where Chenin Blanc usually picks up. It starts with tropical. So you get your um, granadillas, you get your pineapples. And then in the cooler climates, you start to move towards pear and white apples, quince. And then when you get to the really swatland bush vines, you start to get honeys and beautiful textures and flavors. So it's a, very, it's a grape that a lot of winemakers use and they can, they can do a lot of stuff to make a, a Chenin difference. So you, I can give you a Chenin that tastes like a Sauvignon Blanc. I can give you a Chenin that tastes like a Chardonnay. I can give you so many different styles of Chenin. So as I said last time, if you're stuck with one brand of Chenin, I do implore you to go and try different ones because they all have different nuances, different flavors, and it's a wonderful grape. I love it. In terms of this one, I can't believe there's, there's a few Shannons that are, are, are such good value, and this for me is one of them. Um, I opened it earlier because, well, I couldn't wait, and then <clears throat> I smelt it. And you know, this Shannon, for me, I don't know if you guys know Quince. Not Quincy Jones, Craig, Quince. Quince is that fruit that you make into jam. When I smell this, all I smell is Quince. And, I, and, and, and for me, that is a Chenin Blanc giveaway. You get guavas and all this, I also get a, a little bit of white, like white fruit, pear or whatever. So this is this profile. It's well balanced. We'll talk about balance. When we go through the series, I'll talk about how you, you taste for quality and all of those kind of things. I'm not going to do that tonight. So what do you think of this one? Hmm? Hmm. Mike, I'm looking at you. Delicious, yeah. <laughs> cool yeah that's Chenin Blanc um, Chenin Blanc can be oaked like the Sauvignon Blanc you can get unoaked can be stirred on the lease I don't know about that detail you know I think this is this if you want to ask there's a lot of questions to ask here you can ask me the final thing I wanted to talk about is you'll notice that to get your wine out of the bottle you have to use open a cork now I often get asked about corks and screw caps and all of this kind of stuff now, and Harry, which do you prefer? So in the 80s and the 90s, you'll probably remember um, how many wines were, were, were called corked. Now, corked doesn't mean old. Cork is a, a fungi that comes in, into a cork, and it's TCA, it's trichloroanisol. It's got nothing to do with the winemaking. It's got nothing to do with the storage or anything like that. It's to do with what's on the cork. And during those days, one in every 10 to one in every 12 bottles got cork tanked, which is a huge amount if you think about the loss in production or in sales and all of that, because those could get sent back. So then, and then New Zealand were the pioneers, but uh, people started screw caps and alternative closures, rubber stoppers and all of these kind of things. And 15 years has passed and they've managed to test whether the authenticity of the wines stay with the screw caps and oh, there's so many different analyses of this that we don't know. Um, the screw cap does keep the wine. It is inert and it's all good. My favorite closure by far, still is, always will be, is a cork 
This one's actually a conglomerate. So it's pieces of cork that have been um, put together. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. First of all, the romantic notion of popping a cork is amazing. And this is where the French and the Italians and the Spanish are all gaga about. But the most important thing for me is that out of all the closures, the cork is the most biodegradable. And the cork isn't a tree that gets cut down. It's like a sheep that gets sheared. So you've got your cork that grows, you take it off, and then it grows back again. And you only use a little bit of the cork, the bark of the tree, to make the cork. And the rest is being used for various, various products. If you look at Caesar's hat, that's made out of cork, Caesar. And then if you, you, you get pluckies or, 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 or slip slops, you railways, spaceships, this is what corks, because it, it's, 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 it's very unique and then it's, it, it, it can squeeze and it can stop. And so the byproducts are amazing and they create jobs and does all that stuff. It's 100% biodegradable. And the biggest problem with the corks before was the cork taint. With the quality cork producers, they've got so good at their quality that that's almost been eradicated. You still do get cork. Um, I spoke to a guy called uh, Joaquim. He's part of Amarum Corks. He's Portuguese, obviously. Out of the 7,000 odd bottles that were sent to Veritas Awards, there was less than 3% that had cork taint. And some of the screw caps actually had cork taint because they would take on any of the bad stuff that's in the cellar or wherever. I'm loving all the hats. Cardi, nice to join us from Joburg. I'm unmuting you. What do you think of the wine? Well, it's fair to say this is not my first rodeo. Um, it's good. I like it. Uh, so I'm not sure if I missed when you told me how cold it needs to be. It needs to be, Maybe. It needs to, when you look at the bottle, it must look like they're beads of voluptuous sweat going down the curvature of the bottle. Oh, so like Pilates or like squash? More like squash than Pilates. More like squash, I would say. Harry, I've got a question. <laughs> yes. Um, staying with the letter S, um, sinus. Definitely, I think this wine might be better for people who suffer from sinus. Would I be right? So, okay, so this is a question I also always get asked. I don't know if it would be better for sinus. So let me talk about sulfur dioxide and wines. Sulfur, sulfur dioxide is actually a natural byproduct of fermentation. So it's in all wines. Um, some of the organic or biodynamic wines don't add sulfur. Um, it's quite risky. Sulfur dioxide is used as a preservative in wine. So it does two things. It stops things from oxidizing. So when you bite an apple and it goes brown and it goes off, it stops that happening in the wine and it stops microbial damage in the bottle, which is um, bacteria and yeasts and all those kind of things. Um, but some people and uh, choose not to use it and it's great. The thing with the notion that the sulfur dioxide is the thing that gives you headaches can be true. I'm not dismissing it, but if you eat dried mangoes, or if you eat chips from McDonald's, or if you eat chips from a packet, they've got much more sulfur dioxide than any registered bottle is actually allowed in South Africa. So uh, dried fruit, for instance, unless, unless it specifically says no sulfur, is probably 10 times more than any glass of wine you're going to have. So that's the reality. Um, you'll probably find that the headaches come from having that last tequila after your four bottles, or from McCaptains and there's other histamines that actually also appear in wine, depending on the wine making. So, yes, wine can definitely make you congested. I often feel that I'm congested because of uh, wine, but I never know. I can't, as I said earlier, I can't tell if it's because of the wine or the bread or the meat or the, uh, the pollen. You know, we're staying here in, in, in Nuruk. It's crazy. The, um, the guys at my local really nice independent bottle store said that they, it's more the histamines in the sulfur. Sulfur dioxide gets a bad 100%. rep for it. So it's the histamines that can make you feel cuck. That's 100%. And histamines are more likely to happen when you don't. <laughs> so everyone goes, oh, I love this organic wine. I can drink it forever. I don't get a headache. It's more likely actually to happen in organic wine where they use uh, spontaneous fermentation with the yeasts and the bacteria that are around. Um, the commercial ones have been designed or are used specifically because they 
create certain things and part of that isn't histamines or headaches. So you probably find it, I think, I mean, I'm not a winemaker. I've done a winemaking exam. It's the yeasts that do alcoholic fermentation. It's the bacteria that do malolactic fermentation. Just putting it out there, we don't need to discuss it. Go. Hi, Harry. Um, was it good in you? I'm amazing. Okay. Um, my question is, you were mentioning um, uh, that the cost per, is it per hectare was 50,000 versus 35. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, for your hand versus normal, normal winery, yeah. So per what? Per month? No, per, no, per year. Per yield? Per, no, per year. That out? No, it's per year. So oh. it's, it's per year. Per year? Yeah. Harry, I thought organic wine was more expensive to make. That's why it's always so much more expensive to buy. It's a lot more risky. Um, um, Johannes biodynamic. So what he's done is he's created a, a system where there's no waste. So he even, he, you know, the people in, in Stellenbosch, they all got this thatch that they need to get redone. They'll pay people to take that thatch and take it to the rubbish dump. He says, listen, he'll collect it for free and he feeds it into his horses and that manure goes into the grapes. And, and he's, got, he's got ladybirds and he's got bucks and he's got it all happening there. He's even created now his own um, biodynamic veggie patch. Now, if you ever get a chance, go out and try to speak to him. He's the most humble, awesome dude. But, um, but where he saves, so we've just gone through a five-year drought. And people who have been irrigating have conditioned their vines to need irrigation. And the roots aren't as, the roots aren't at depth. And with the hummus that he, that he had created, not hummus, the food, the, the hummus, the, the organic matter in his soil. He doesn't pay for the pesticides, the fungicides, all of that kind of stuff. He's got the cattle. Harry. Thing. Sorry, I was going to say, does it age uh, okay, organic wine? He made, he, made a, he made a Chenin Blanc, which I tasted, which he didn't add sulfur. You can't just do this. You can't just take a wine and not add sulfur dioxide at the end. It needs to be part of the whole system from the vineyard all the way to the end. You can't just make a natural wine out of unnatural grapes that have had pesticides and stuff. It's got to go the whole way through. The... Anyway, he made a wine and it was a reserve Chenin. And I tasted it and it was as close as I've ever tasted to the Lure Valley uh, Chenins. And he'd opened it for a week, that bottle, and it was still as fresh as a daisy. So it depends. You know, I think there are some organic producers out there. I think there are some that are organic, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I would drink their wine quickly, <laughs> personally. So, so, Harry, so do you mean that when you say, like, sometimes it's a bit risky, do you mean that it's risky when they're making the wine, or do you mean they're risky if you're buying the wine? No, risk if they're making the wine. So what you want when you're making a wine is you want that fermentation to complete. The longer that fermentation takes to happen. So fermentation, let's talk about fermentation. Fermentation, like any alcoholic beverage, you get a sugar water, yeast comes in, whether it's from the environment or whether you've inoculated it, it eats that sugar. It creates carbon dioxide, heat, and it creates alcohol, right? So that's what happens. Um, and you want that, when you pick a grape, it's got sugar in it. People measure the sugar because that's going to tell you how much alcohol is in the bottle. Um, and you want that fermentation to happen as quickly as possible. Well, not as quickly as possible, but it needs to be controlled and it needs to carry on going. If you get a stuck fermentation halfway through or a sluggish fermentation that's too slow, there's other bad yeasts and bad bacteria that can come in it's a turf war out there with the yeasts and they're fighting for domain and all of this kind of stuff. When people making, so when people are inoculating a wine up front, they're using a very strong yeast, a yeast that's been tested and that yeast will go and nine times out of 10 will take it straight through to its um, completion. So it will ferment it dry in the right time and it doesn't need so much of its food like ammonia and all of this kind of stuff. 
the wild yeast that happen when you do spontaneous fermentation, which the natural guys do, they're, they're not very strong. They're, they're weak and they only play a little bit part. So one yeast will do two days and then the other one will come in and eat it and kill it to the battlefield and the next one will do it. But what happens is when the alcohol goes too high or the sugar goes too high or too low or it's too hot because remember we said it creates heat in the environment, the, the weaker yeasts die. And if that happens and it's stopped, then baddies come in and they can ruin your wine. So this is the game and the risk that they're playing with. You know, but those, that said, the people that have established with um, spontaneous fermentation and those that have got wild yeast and they've been doing it for a time, those yeasts, yeasts are strong anyway. They're going to go through. Harry, I just wanted to ask you, in terms of these winemakers that are, I mean, they sound completely fascinating. I'd love to meet, you know, all the guys that you've spoken about, especially in terms of the biodynamic farming and all of that. It's like, it's, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I'd love to see it in action. Yeah. Hopefully, I mean, once we once we come out on the other side of this, um, would you consider maybe putting together some kind of a? <laughs> my husband's such a loss. Um, would you consider putting together some kind of a tour that we could go and visit these yes. guys? Yes. Yes, I would. I mean, I definitely. I mean, I do. So the tour, those tours, is what like I. Like a survivor tour. Yes, we want to do it. Okay, we'll give you a tour. So that was the second session. A lot less messy than the first session and things seem to flow a lot better and which is great for in terms of improvement there was still a hell of a lot of editing uh, as you can probably hear and see and the session went on a lot longer you can still see that at this stage it was very much social and still people bonding interacting in isolation um, and really needing to get that um, interaction going so yes I, I edited out a whole lot of the social stuff right at the end but still good and amazing and hopefully you can see the advancement from the first one.